Hey. Hey, how's it going, man? Good, how are you? I'm doing pretty good, just chilling here on a Monday night, just having some... I'm not even having any beers or anything, I'm just chilling. <laughs> so, let's, uh, let's talk cinema. Yeah, let's talk cinema. So, I was actually watching... Um, Joel Haver uh, did a uh, a promo years ago, um, and it's a uh, it was first film Island. I was watching it. It was like, and it's like this rip on. I don't know if you've ever seen it. The old classic uh, that John Cassavetes interview. The television sucks. Have you seen that? Hmm. You've seen it. Yeah. I don't know that I don't know. I always thought that was funny, and then I like was on his Vimeo page because I I don't know how I got lost through it today, but and then I was just thinking about that, and I was just like, I don't know that that really captured me. That that was like the first thing that I remember seeing of Joel's and being like, okay, this is like totally my vibe. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, Island was how I first uh, found Joel as well. It was that he um he made like a Reddit post about the trailer to Island. And I think he was selling views of the movie for like five bucks where people could just mm -hmm. watch it on Vimeo. And I watched the trailer and I thought it looked interesting and good. And, um, I took the plunge and I, I mostly took the plunge ironically because people weren't really responding to it on our filmmakers or, or whatever. <laughs> like it, yeah. it, it wasn't really getting, you know, much love there. Um, but no. looked good to me. So I mean, the rest is history. I'm I'm glad I watched that movie. I'm glad I, um, you know, gained that that friend, and then that friend turned into more friends, and it just you know blossomed and blossomed um, to the point that you know we're all just we're we're cooking, you know, we're all making yeah. our stuff. <laughs> yeah, I, I just it's just kind of crazy. I was just thinking about how far we've come since that. Like that moment yeah. felt like not too long ago, and then I like was like, "Holy shit, that was from twenty nineteen. That was five years ago." Um, and it just like kind of like hit me this weird moment of like, all this stuff that I consider to be recent history is like almost ancient history in my mind now. <laughs> like if you if you really look through it, it's like it before you know it, some of the stuff's gonna be ten years old, and we're gonna be like, "Oh, island," you know. Like I I think that's gonna be something that's interesting about the the space the folk filmmaking truly independent whatever you want to call it space is like realizing that these films 10 years on are going to be you know maybe some of them will even be considered you know independent classics of some sort i just think it's gonna be an interesting time to see the, these films kind of age gracefully yeah i mean to borrow a norm mcdonald saying you know i'm i'm an old chunk of coal so like I went through that with uh with Shredder. <laughs> and so um you know Shredder and then making Strummer 10 years later. And that feeling was interesting like cuz you know I got started pretty early <laughs> on. You guys were yeah. still uh in diapers and whatnot when I was making Shredder <laughs> it feels like. And um you know I always felt like a little bit like the the old guy at the at the table in a certain sense because of that. Cause like I was hitting my like 10 year mark anniversary um, right around the time when we were like becoming friends and all that. So it's interesting. Time flies, yeah, man. It is. It is interesting. Cause I was like, you know, it's funny. Cause I, 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 I marked it with the, the release of chlorine was in 2020 and but it was made in 2019 and then now it's the new one's coming out uh chlorine kills is coming out 2024 and so it's basically been five years on and I, I was just like how crazy has the space shifted because i was like it, i really felt like for me when chlorine came out it was like that was like kind of like the start of all of us like me and you and joel had already kind of connected i think before that um but like that was like once chlorine came out and then you were dropping some films and Joel was dropping films, that's kind of like when all of us as a collective sort of found each other and like found that sort of group of random people that kind of were making films. And it's just kind of weird to think that like nearly a decade, like half a decade later, it's like now 
I'm dropping a new film that's a sequel to the film that kind of started some some connections. And now I'm like, I can't even imagine where things are going to go five years on, you know? Mm-hmm. And we're doing Pure Cinema 3. And who knows, yeah. there could be Pure Cinema 4 and 5 and 6. Like, as as things go on, this could be this kind of time capsule that you keep revisiting. Well, I, watched, uh, I watched Pure okay? Cinema 1 the other night. Um, yeah. to just kind of refresh and like see what it was uh, like compared to what I rem- my memory of it because I, I liked it at the time but and in my mind it was like in my mind it was this very polished piece and when I revisited it it was interesting how like it, it has this immediacy that I had kind of forgotten about it where it isn't like a perfect uh, interview movie you know what I mean like it's it's yeah. it's a little jagged and it needs to be that way. And that's a quality that I actually like about it that I had forgotten that it had. Um, yeah. But the thing that I loved about it was like, it was um, it was you and you, you could feel the sense of you wanting to um, like be, sorry, be motivated. You were motivated by Joel's decision and like you let, you carried that, with you it was like a baton was passed immediately and i love that aspect of it and like when i think back to that first year of like making a movie instead of watching the oscars i remember that night thinking like man should i do one too like should i should i just <laughs> like because dan's doing one joel's doing one should i do one as well i think i just wasn't in the mood that night but like that kind of baton passing and the constant baton passing i think that's one aspect of what we all do and do for each other that I think um, gets lost unless there's a document of that specifically. And pure cinema is a document of what that kind of feels like, where we're just passing these batons like all the time, where like you'll make something and then that'll give me an idea for something or I'll do something and that'll fuel something with you, where we're just constantly, almost like an improv yes and, we're just passing batons back and forth like all the time. Um, and so I think that was that was a really cool uh, illustration of that with pure cinema. Well, and, and I think it was it was weird because like for a film that like has taken up such a small percentage of my time filming it weirdly. I honestly feel like pure cinema might be the most one of the, my most lasting pieces. Like I hear people talk about it pretty like even though it's been almost, you know, three, four years since I made that. I still hear people talk about it, even if it's in like a joking context or a meme context. Um, and I do think that there's something interesting about the how quick, how like you can make something so quick and can have sort of a a texture to it that like just like colors the walls in a certain way and makes them a certain texture. And and you're you're not really going to like lose that for a while. And I I don't know. I think there was something interesting about it. And I feel like there's other pieces I've done, you know, like I think my film winner is kind of like trying to recapture a little bit of that pure cinema essence, uh, I would say in some way, but um, yeah, I don't know. It was, it was an interesting piece to make. And I, I remember just being like, when I saw Joel was making a feature, I like, it was like something in my brain immediately was just like, Oh my gosh, I got to do this right now. Cause like, if I don't, I'm going to regret it. <laughs> so it was yeah. just like an immediate, like sort of, I got to do it. And and then, and then I did it. And then, you know, little did I know it was going to become such a big thing. Like I thought it might've been like that year. And then I didn't really think it was going to be like a thing we would do like every year. And then once Joel was like, Hey, we're going to do this contest and all the stuff. Um, yeah, it was, it was kind of a surreal experience. Yeah. It, um, it, it has a great shorthand to it. Pure cinema. Um, and yeah. like, I think that's like the people that don't like it, you know, the, the, the couple people that like, are like, what the fuck is this? I think they're <laughs> missing out on like, um, the happiness like that you could get from watching something like that. Like, I don't know why sometimes someone's happiness will be, uh, will make somebody else so angry, but that does yeah. happen a lot when you're making movies. Like you'll be so happy about something you've created and you you just kind of implicitly 
like assume that like, oh, other people, when they interact with it, they're going to feel that same energy or it's going to rub off on them. And then you'll find like it does the exact opposite for just a certain segment of the population. Um, your your yeah. joy and your exuberance just becomes, um, you know, kind of their worst nightmare. And it just brings up either insecurities or inadequacies or I'm not doing something or yeah. I could be doing something and it would be better than this or feelings of yeah. whatever it just uh, confronts people i feel like art can confront people in that way especially art well, made by people that you know you don't feel that different from that like oh well, i could be doing this you know it's like it's I, the classic art thing of i could paint that and it's like well you didn't paint that and maybe you could well, paint that and, and go for there it there was a rev there was a review on the original film on letterbox i don't know if you've seen the thread but like like had like 27 like full paragraphs responses and everyone's debating whether or not this was a movie or not and i'm like we've debated this movie more than other movies that you would consider movies <laughs> and yeah, yeah. It, it just by the mere just the mere fact that you were dis discussing it that long that warrants it as being a movie in my mind like if you're willing to put pour into paragraphs and paragraphs about why it is it's not cinema it can't be cinema it's like that it almost like breathes life into it being cinema just by that mere fact you yeah. know it's like the people who hate the star wars prequels but they will do nine hour or 12 hour reviews of you know one of the even just phantom menace or something like that and it's like if you spend more time saying that something is bad than you even spent watching the thing, it has to be good. There, There's something <laughs> there yeah. to it. It's like the old joke of like the guy who goes into the woods and, um, you know, he tries to shoot the bear and the bear flips him around, rapes him in the ass. And the bear eventually after like three or four times is like, something tells me you don't come here just to hunt, you know? <laughs> if, if, if you're if you're spending that much time allegedly hating have you not heard that joke before <laughs> I've, I've, I've heard that joke i've heard that joke okay. before <laughs> yeah um if you're spending that much time hating on a movie there's some love there and that's worth yeah. exploring uh at some point and i think that's hard for some people it's like it, it i think loving art there's a sexuality to it. There's like a, you know, it's like, what does this say about me that I'm, I'm into this? And so you're like, well, yeah. I didn't like it. You know, like it, it brings up yeah. really complicated, complicated things for people. I think liking or not liking art or whatever. I've definitely had experiences when I was much younger where like, I liked a movie, but then everybody else in the room hated it. And I just kind of like, um, morphed yeah. my experience into something that more resembled their experience. And yep. then later on, years later, I was like, no, fuck them. I'm, I was totally right when I like rewatch it or yeah. something on my own. Um, I remember sitting with my friends. We had just saw the film Drive. Um, and that was like a seminal film for all of us. Like it was like a bunch of dude bros like watching it. And then, you know, the pre the following year, he came out with a film called Only God Forgives. And Only God Forgives is like the anti-drive of like it it's like emasculates the main character like to the, an extent that is like so the opposite of drive and all of my friends just sat there and they were like appalled they like they hated it and i was like that was pretty good <laughs> and i remember just being like yelled at the whole night <laughs> yeah yeah like, that's interesting i um you, that was kind of my experience a little bit with phantom menace um, and you know, I loved it like when I was a kid and I loved it. Like I saw it like one or two times and I was really into it. And I was kind of at the age where like there were kids that, you know, had older brothers. And so the older brothers were talking shit on it and the younger brothers would eventually kind of copy that because it would make them feel a little older and a little cooler. And so I, I watched the tides turn on that movie and the kid response start to resemble the teen response or the the uh, college response or whatever. Um, and I it made me be like, well, yeah, I guess it was kind of dopey or kind of stupid or whatever. And like, you know, in retrospect, 
as a grown man, all the dopey aspects are totally intentional and all the goofy aspects are totally intentional. And even things that like on like a subtle nuance level um, feel like wrong notes, like the more I explore them and the more I look at them in the prequels, like I just end up loving them more and more and feeling like they they add like a rich energy to it that you wouldn't have it any other way. Um, I, you know, I, I think like, I have like a little bit of a fan theory on pure cinema that I just want to, um, lay out to you real quick, if that's all right. Yeah, go for it. So this isn't like, it's not like a traditional fan theory of like, oh, I have some, uh, weird read on it. It's the, it's almost like a vision for pure cinema. I see pure cinema as mirroring, um, the prequels in a certain way and hear me out so okay. <laughs> pure cinema one phantom menace is kind of like a it's a prologue it's we're getting to know these characters but everything doesn't really matter that much i've i've heard um there there's a great writer um uh mike Klimo, who writes about uh the prequels he, he's the one that came up with like ring theory and as it yeah. pertains to it um and he talks about the, the Phantom Menace as as a prologue and how um, it it mirrors what a prologue should be. Uh, the prologue the prologue establishes tones and and people, but like it doesn't matter as much as the actual uh, beginning of the story, which one could argue is uh, the second film and onward. It's just kind of like setting things up a little bit. Um, and I think pure cinema is kind of like a prologue. It's like, here's some ideas that of, of what this series could be. And let's, let's just get these down onto paper or onto celluloid a little bit. And that's going to be the energy. So that's pure cinema one. Now in pure cinema one, you talk about not liking attack of the clones and feeling like it's too <laughs> much. And it's like, you still aren't really, you know, fully on board with that one. Pure Cinema 2 is just as insane a concept and and overlong <laughs> and crazy as Attack of the Clones. So that Pure Cinema 2 is your Attack of the Clones. And part of my goal with uh with Pure Cinema 3 is personally to me Revenge of the Sith, that's my favorite Star Wars movie. And yeah, it's, so it's great. I'm I'm trying to make sure that this movie is the best pure cinema movie yet. The, the, now the, I'm like fully prepared. <laughs> yeah, I'm fully prepared for the vast majority of watchers to pure, to prefer pure cinema four, five, and six, and be yes. more on board with those. That those will please the masses, maybe. But me personally, <laughs> I'm trying to make sure pure cinema three is the shit. Um, that's my, that's, I don't even know if I can call it a fan theory, but that's what I, I propose here. You've and grafted, I know how you've you feel. grafted the, the Star Wars ethos on top of it. Yeah. Actually, once you were saying it, I was like, I, I was like thinking about pure cinema too. And I was like, he's, he's right. I know where he's going with this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, but like, I mean, again, and it was funny cause pure cinema two was sort of like a, a meme joke. Mm -hmm. thing like it was literally like i made pure cinema and then we had a bunch of people like who were just hating on like the idea of us making a movie and i was like wouldn't it be funny if we just turned a literal live stream into a movie and just like treated it like a movie and it's funny because it's like that film has more views literally because it's named pure cinema 2 even though it's literally just a fucking live stream <laughs> yeah um and so i, I thought it was funny it was just like a little bit of troll humor, but then um, I think it did sort of stick in a way. But uh, that it, that is really hilarious. Yeah, and I think that the the series can just kind of build and build. Like we're doing, you know, anybody watching this right now knows that we're doing something a little bit avant garde with this one. With I'm releasing my version, you're releasing your version, and and all that. Like I feel like each pure cinema can kind of subvert in that way. Like the second one obviously subverted as far as it just being a live stream, but presented yeah. as a movie if somebody wants to interact with it as that. Um, but basically just a live stream. I feel like each pure cinema can kind of reinvent uh, pure cinema in a certain way. 
Well, and I thought the idea of, because I, I had toyed with doing a pure cinema three for a while now, actually. Um, so this kind of like randomly crept up on me um, because I, there was part of me that was thinking like, is pure cinema three just a narrative film? Like, do we just randomly just like, like, does it just randomly just slip into a narrative? And then the next entry is a, is a, you know, docu journal thing or like, like, where could it possibly go and what kind of ideas could we have? I, I think each pure cinema could be a completely different expression of cinema without it necessarily. Like, I don't feel like each film has to to bend to any form of the previous films. It's not like I agree. Yeah. Stylistically, it doesn't really matter. In my opinion. I think I mean, I, 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 the only thing I'll interject with is that the fifth pure cinema has to have a uh, a huge take a huge turn that becomes ubiquitous, mirroring the <laughs> you know I am your father. <laughs> like there needs to yeah. be some revelation in the fifth one. That's that's the only thing that I suggest. Is that there's got to be some sort of big <laughs> yeah somebody's got to reveal out of, out of something nowhere. huge in the fifth one for sure. Um, yeah. I think it's funny just how as filmmakers, you know, we've made like our both our own bodies of work and now we're just randomly calling each other and we're making it up like a like I was th I was thinking about it. I was I was kind of preparing myself today in a weird way, like spiritually preparing myself to do this this I like literally went uh and like got all this nice food and then I like went to the par this park that I go to and I went on a walk and then I went and I visited my dad at his grave and I did like all this stuff just kind of like getting myself in the correct headspace because I knew I was going to be doing doing like some sort of thing that like required me to be in a good energy you know and I was just thinking about how like our story and like you know us knowing each other and then we you know there was parts where we we talked and we didn't talk but you know i think it was overall like i thought it was cool to think like hey we're me and cody you're making a movie you know i was thinking about that and i was I, that got me excited yeah i'm a, i was totally jazzed about it too i didn't go through as much preparation as you did just because i woke up kind of late and i was like just kind of get getting things together and and all that but um yeah, it's, you know, we've had these kind of conversations, these phone conversations in the past, and like, now we're making that cinema in a certain way. Um, and yeah. we're kind of, we're, I, I feel like when you're an artist, uh, there's a way to make anything you do art. Um, and w because we're filmmakers, there's anything we do, we can probably film and turn into something. And that's one of the yeah. big revelations of of making the kind of smaller movies that we do is that like, you know, what you were just describing to me, you know, it conjured up visual images of like you going through your day prepper in, in preparation. And that could have been a movie, you know, that could have been yeah. pure cinema 2.5 or something like that. There's <laughs> there's just no end to the amount of movies we can make. It's almost like a fractal, like as we just delve deeper and deeper and deeper and we'll, we'll discover more different ways that that we can find a movie from. Well, and, and that's it's really exciting. Yeah, it isn't exciting. And, and I, I think about I was working on a video this week about how I'm going to make 100 feature films like that's my goal. Like I, I've already set that goal for a while now that like my goal is to be a part of at least 100 feature films in some different way, because I want like my contribution to cinema at some level to be a noticeable one. You know what I mean? Even if it's something that's not never makes the splash that like some like giant Hollywood director might make. I do want it to be something where like people will take notice and be like, oh, my gosh, this guy made a hundred projects, a hundred things that were over 45 minutes or an hour or something like that. And, and there was clearly time and effort and love put into those into those frames. And whenever I add stuff to the playlist, it's like this point of pride of like being like, OK, like there's another like little I'm chipping away at that goal. And uh I just feel blessed every day when I think about it that like there are filmmakers who literally make one film and then they just disappear. Uh, you know, I was thinking about uh, Shane Carruth, actually, um, and just kind of the way his life has gone as of lately. Um, and 
I don't know if you know anything about what happened with him and all that stuff. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. I was just I just learned about that a couple months ago. I I had no idea of that stuff yeah, that was going on. And and I was just thinking about him, and I was thinking like just about his filmography and how like. Uh, Shane Carruth could easily upload his films to YouTube if he wanted to. You know what I mean? If he truly wanted to. Yeah. But he chooses, like, he chooses not to at some level. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, it's a choice. At this point, it's a choice. Um, I feel that way for a lot of different guys where I feel like greed is kind of getting in the way. It's almost like a Last Crusade type thing where, like, you know, you you drink from the chalice and now you're just sitting in this chamber all day every day yeah. like it's like it's just a weird um it's a weird thing to agree to once you get embroiled and in, in, in bridled what's what word am i looking for is it did i, I get think, it right I think, I think you're i think you're right i think you're yeah when you get stuck em, in the I, system em, i think it's embroiled embroiled like, maybe okay yeah <laughs> when, maybe. when you're when you're entrenched, let's go with entrenched. <laughs> when you're entrenched in the system, and that's that becomes your standard for you creating something, it's going to be years, sometimes decades, before you do it again. And I think about that in regards to Richard Kelly, who mm -hmm. I I kind of um, connected to pretty strongly with with Donnie Darko. Um, yeah, I, I wasn't really into Southland Tales, but I think the box is very good. I think it's pretty underrated. <laughs> um, yeah, but you know, he's, he, you, you talk to him in like an interview and he'll be like, yeah, I'm working on like all these other things and I've been trying to make things and all that. And it's like, yeah, everything you try and make, it never sees the light of day. I've heard of like 10 different projects of his <laughs> that just never see the light of day. And it's like, I get that you want your movies to be feel big and feel important and you want to get them properly funded and all that. But at a certain point, like you, I think the studio system probably just thinks like, look at this fool, look how we can kind of like get him to not create just by, just by pure greed. Like it, it really is. It does come down to it. If you think you need $50 million or $20 million to like uh, put your vision together, it's like, no, dude. If if you're gonna have twenty million dollars, put it into like property or like building, <laughs> you know, your own yeah. Lucas Films, uh, Skywalker Ranch or or whatever. Like, but just make you, you can always make a smaller movie, always. Well, and I think that's the thing that like, and I, I and I don't even think small needs to be some synonymous with like not intricate or not. Right. time consuming or not even like well produced like i think about chlorine kills like i'm making it right now and it's like it's the biggest movie i've made but it's so much smaller considering like what other indie filmmakers probably would have to play with like millions of dollars but i think like the scale of it can still feel just as big of a scale as a different type of movie if you spend the correct time and effort into it and 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 me and you, I think, are both filmmakers that kind of play on different ends. Like, for the most part, I think a lot of our films take very short periods of time to record. But I think we both have had projects that have, like, spanned multiple, either multiple years or have spanned a decent amount of time either getting made or edited and produced. And I mm -hmm. think, like, you can have both of those. And I think, like, yeah, it's just I find it funny that there are directors who like could greenlight themselves. They have the audience and they could literally like make a film. Folk film style, you know, whatever, how you want to call it, and they could literally have that. And they would like they would probably clean up, you know what I mean? Like if if tomorrow, you know, Kevin Smith went out with like a couple, you know, a seven threes and shot a movie in a week it probably would do pretty good <laughs> if you put it on youtube or whatever you know what i mean like i think mm -hmm. most people would be interested in that like you'd be like whoa that's kind of weird but like there's this weird it's like a force field or something it's like a it's like a, a thing that keeps them from wanting to like break down those walls yeah i wish more filmmakers kind of would play around with very consumer you know, consumer in quotes cameras 
like how Michael Mann kind of got into that for a little bit of a time period. And like, I wasn't that crazy about his experiments with that. Like, I, I appreciate certain aspects for sure. <laughs> um, but it's the, it's that the level shutter of shutter speed. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But that, that <laughs> level of creativity and curiosity, I, you know, it, I think by the time Wes Anderson has made all of his movies, you know, one of the things I'll kind of be like, man, I wish blah, 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 is like, you know, he shot um, Fantastic Mr. Fox on a DSLR um, because he's just taking frames. So it was the, it was the thing that made the most sense um, for him yeah. to use. And I often wonder, like, man, imagine if Wes Anderson would make like a DSLR movie, like an actual movie. Um because oh, yeah. you know, I feel like I've shown that like with a DSLR, you can make almost like a Wes Anderson y kind of like intricate set thing, like with Ramekin, where I, I, I found that great apartment and I was able to use that weird wallpaper and all sorts of things. And like even with like No Shark, just like the framing, like you can make a um a, what like a, a normie would call like a Wes Anderson-y type movie because just they don't really have the words to put together for like oh you just mean like the setting is as interesting as like the people and like the costumes are as interesting as the setting yeah. and like everything's balanced in that way I would just love to see him do something that free especially because you know how there's been this rise I actually I, I shouldn't assume but um, there has been, the, I shouldn't assume that you know it, I mean, but um, there's this, this rise of like finding accidental Wes Anderson stuff in life where like people will yeah. find like something in a Wes Anderson mm -hmm. font or yeah, like a building that. that looks, yeah, yeah. I yeah. would love to see a Wes Anderson movie where he just used pre-existing stuff, like finds oh, yeah. locations that are real well, and, and well, plops down a camera in front of that. And like I mean, that's... that's that's just bottle rocket like you could literally just exactly do like... exactly i love bottle rocket and he hates bottle rocket <laughs> and that's Wes anderson that's... is the worst judge of his own taste absolutely to me those first three movies fucking i i'll i'll go i'll go four i'll go five i'll, I'll go five in a row those first yeah. four or five movies unbelievable um, oh yeah, I think for me it peaked with uh, Rushmore, but uh, I I do yeah. really feel like that Bottle Rocket, Rushmore, uh, Tenenbaums, that those run of movies. Yeah, was when I was, was a kid. Truly seeing, special. When I was a kid, seeing Rushmore in the theater with my mom in like a small little theater. I mean, there was maybe four or five people in the audience. That was one of the the defining moments for me cinematically was yeah. looking up and seeing that movie and being like, what is this? Like, I didn't know you could do this. I didn't, I wasn't getting what he was hearkening back to because I wasn't exposed to any of that. You know, I was just like, oh yeah, I was maybe like 12 or something or 11. <laughs> when, um, when you don't even like, you can't even place the references. They just feel so fresh because you're just exactly you're so similar. Similar thing with Kill Bill, actually. When I saw Kill Bill in theaters, I was like, I, I just became voracious as far as like, all right, what are all the all the movies and things that he's uh, hearkening back to with this? I was I was just like kind of like pulling it apart. And it was it's a lot yeah. easier with something like Tarantino than it is with Wes Anderson. Um, but no. basically, you know, these movies were like, you realize that th this guy is so familiar with all this great stuff that like all the all the needle drops in Rushmore, I'm like, I didn't know this kind of music even existed. Like I've heard older mu <laughs> music, I've heard '60s music, '70s music, I've heard like the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, but like these these very precise needle drops. Um, and I know Scorsese was a huge influence on on Wes Anderson, and he's he's well known for his amazing needle drops as well. But like that needle drop aspect and that like that thing where you can take a film that you fall in love with and you can just you can unpack the influences for the rest of your life um that that was a key moment for me seeing that in theaters i i remember i saw that and i saw office space i'm like one of the few people <laughs> in the world that saw office space in the fucking theater everybody else That's... saw that on v on video cassette when like it was safe to like be like this is a good movie I saw a matinee of that with my mom. We were, I think we were the only two people in the theater probably just because we, we thought it looked good. We, we saw like the trailers on TV and we thought it looked funny. 
And so we went and yeah. saw it and nobody believed us that it was funny. We were like, it was so good. You have to see Office Space. <laughs> and they were like, oh, I don't know about that. It, it, people thought it was going to be trash for some reason. Obviously, yeah, it goes I, on to I becoming don't, I don't know. one of the biggest comedies ever. Um, oh, but yeah. those, those two movies, Rushmore and Office Space, I saw either in the same year or a year apart. And those were like foundational as far as like, like what is going on? Like, I didn't know you can make a, a comedy movie that intricate in two different directions. Um, because I, I don't think Office Space and Rushmore would be typically compared. But like at the time, there was nothing like Office Space and there was nothing like Rushmore. And they couldn't be further apart. And they were both kind of slept on a little bit when they first came out. And I was just obsessed with them for sure. Yeah, I think they were, uh, they're both just movies that, you know, they kind of just stick in your brain. They, they just kind of stick there. And, and I do remember kind of seeing both of them. And I, I remember seeing, I don't know if you ever seen another film that kind of like, I don't know why it like attaches my brain in the same place. Uh, it's called Way Downtown. I don't know if you ever saw it. Never heard of it. Oh, it's, uh, I think it's, uh, I'm trying to remember who the director is. Oh, I cannot for the life of me remember. It's, uh, this comedy and the the basically the premise is it's like three friends and they live in a, a community where their apartments are connected to the mall so it's basically they they live in these homes that are connected to the mall and they make this bet and this wager that basically how long can they go without breathing fresh air so they basically stay inside the whole time they go from their apartment to the mall they all work at the mall and then this like, sounds incredible how have i never heard about this it's a it's a 2000s film it's shot like it looks like it's shot on like the crappiest camera you've ever seen but like it's great it's fucking phenomenal and it's like in my mind it's just up there with like office space i like, want to see that really badly i yeah, will probably yeah, watch that tonight <laughs> It is really good. It's really good. It's hard to find, but you if you if you look it up, you can like find a pirate version of it somewhere. It's did like you ever see of... um did you ever see that movie Chuck and Buck? I have not. That's the first um Mike White movie. Um he's in it and he wrote it and um it it's it's uh you know the camera that they shot like twenty eight days later with that kind of like weird dv camera yeah. early dv camera yeah it's shot it's shot with one of those and it's just like uh that's kind of like that's what what later would become mumblecore yeah um but before that it was just kind of like it was used in this very um poetic ethereal way kind of like with julian donkey boy because it was i think they would they used the same mm -hmm. camera for that one um but chuck and buck i would definitely recommend as one of those like oh eye-opening uh early 2000s indies i think you'd really yeah. like that one I'm trying to think of other great mini dv um have you ever seen blonde death no um, what's that yeah, one yeah it's uh 1980s maybe 90s i want to say it was probably 90s uh but i think it takes place in the 80s and it's like uh trashy kind of it's like all done like almost like narrate like narrated style like sort of like badlands but imagine mm -hmm. if it was done like oh, it's the trashiest movie that you've ever seen it's like this very transgressive there's Sounds a couple characters or like yeah it's just it's just kind of like a it's a weird fucking movie and I, but i fucking love it um it's it's uh it's but i'm pretty sure it's shot on mini dv as well it's the only film the director ever did i think the guy ended up dying not too long afterwards but um, wow. he he made a movie and then yeah it, it's, it's pretty interesting i saw it on vimeo a couple of years ago um i i yeah i watch a lot of just random weird things that i'm like i don't feel anyone's ever seen <laughs> me too yeah i especially with movie going culture becoming so homogenized and like oh, we got to see all the MCU or we got to see the new <laughs> Dune or whatever. It's like, uh, even with television shows, I was feeling that with a certain point where like, I, I didn't want to be watching everything that everybody else was watching just because 
I didn't want to be influenced by everything that everybody else was being influenced by. So I would often make a conscious choice to like watch TV that nobody else was watching or movies that nobody was else yeah. else was watching just because I think it keeps me like healthy as an artist. Um, well, it just keeps you like fresh. Like you're, you're, yeah, you're yeah, yeah. pulling and from. And it's also like things get forgotten all the time. Like if you don't, well, if you don't seek out certain movies, like then nobody's no going to know about them. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a weird thing where like, I do feel like, there's so much media out there now and there's so much stuff that's just like accessible and there's so many options. There's so many things that just go completely unnoticed. And like, I was thinking like we kind of are in the first generation of filmmakers who are being inspired by filmmakers from their, their generation in a weird way. Like I was thinking about like, I watched Island and then I've been inspired by Island and made films that are inspired by Island. And it's like that film only came out five years ago. And I think that there's this weird like acceleration that we're going through right now where we're accelerating the the process from inspiration to creation. Whereas like your Spielbergs, your Coppola's, your, you know, Schrader's were inspired by people who made films 20, 30 years prior to them, maybe maybe even as close as 10 years. Now you're having filmmakers making a film and the next year you're making a film that's a response to that. And I think mm -hmm. the, that that acceleration is is both brought on by YouTube and the and the, the the platform of just being able to post stuff. And then there's it's so easily accessible. You can like zoom through a bunch of stuff real quick and then suddenly you have like all this new juice in you. And, and I, I think that's one thing I really like about uh, that, that folk filmmaking, that truly independent, that space is that like. I'm getting new shit all the time. Like I'm and and it's giving me new ideas and, and giving me th new thoughts. And I think like we're already seeing those films be influential on other things, whether consciously or subconsciously. Mm -hmm. Well, I think cinema in itself at its best is a, a constant dialogue and reformation about what a movie even is. Um, and as we add to that more and more and like, not just in like experimental ways of like a live stream as a movie or whatever like that, but just uh, tone wise in, in more subtle ways um, that we can respond to and, and be influenced by constantly and quickly. Um, we're, we're finding what even independent film even is. And that's been a huge explosion over the past five years of like what, what even a, a movie on YouTube is because I think a lot of people for a very specific time probably thought a YouTube movie was, oh, somebody who's famous on YouTube for doing some other videos, they're going to do like Fred the movie, movie. or they're going to do like yeah. some YouTube channel will have a movie and it'll be trash and it'll be terrible and it'll be unwatchable <laughs> and then everybody moves on. Um, and no, what? it can be this very subtle place. It can be a very artful thing, and it, it reminds me, I just watched for the first time, I'd seen the clip cut out, but I had watched, never watched the documentary Hearts of Darkness until literally like last week, and it's that last, you've seen it, right? I don't want to spoil this, right? No, I've never seen it. I've only seen clips like you. Okay, um, but I think you've seen the, the Francis Ford, the, the Fat Girl in Ohio clip. Have you seen that? Or do uh, you not know that? Ref refresh me I, it sounds so oh. familiar that i'll probably remember so it right away so but... basically francis Ford coppola after making this bombastic overdrawn film they they interview him like t 20 years later and they're like kind of asking him about all the stuff in the documentary and he goes like, you know my ultimate vision for cinema is that some little fat girl from ohio is going to be the next auteur, you know, right, like she's going to yeah. get it. She's going to she's going to get her her camera, her dad's camera, and she's going to go and film something. It's going to be a masterpiece. And all this this other stuff is just a, you know, a facsimile of what cinema could be, is right now. But it could be so much more, so much personal or, you know, more personal. And mm -hmm. and. I don't know, it was just really powerful because it's like the very final like takeaway you have after you you know you watch this man labor out over a three and a half hour epic 
Yeah. His basically his end message is like, I really hope that the the next generation makes really small personal films that don't need to do this bullshit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I'm I, familiar with the clip. And um I I feel like he's a very um self tortured filmmaker in that like I think his best work and I'm I'm not alone in that regard, you know. I, I Vincent Gallo says the same thing. The Rain People is like extraordinary and so so small and so perfect. Have you have you seen The Rain People? I have not. I oh my it. god. It's like <laughs> dude, it's you watch The Rain People and like you're like, what are you doing making Apocalypse Now if you can make this? <laughs> like, bro, like, come home. Just make movies here. Just little tiny ones. Like, you're so good. Uh, and I you think, just want to, like, I think shake he's him. one of those, he's kind of like, uh, he's at war with himself a little bit. Like, he Absolutely. always wants to, like, kind of make something that's... Because when I watched, I just actually watched Apocalypse Now for the first time, too, recently. Um, and, like, I, I couldn't get through it. I mean, I, I loved it, but I, like, I got, I fell asleep. <laughs> yeah. Um, and after, like, because I watched, like, the extended three-hour cut. And I was like, this is just, like, it's, like, a film that's both trying to be extremely personable, but also be as grand as possible. And it's, like... I need it to do one or the other. You know what I mean? Like, I don't need both. Yeah. I don't need it to be a, both this personal odyssey. And then there's also this epic grand thing. It's, I just want it to be one thing, you know? If it's going to be epic and it's going to be, like, make it the whole thing, you know? Make it that, like, for the whole two hours. You know what I mean? Make it crazy. Um, or make it an extremely personal war story. But, like, it, it, it kind of feels like he's at that point where he can't decide whether or not. And I, I kind of felt like I had similar issues. Like, I remember seeing The Godfather and thinking, like, oh, it's okay. I don't know. Like, I, I never was, like, really, like, that taken away as being, like, it, as a masterpiece or anything like that. Um, maybe that's controversial. but No, I feel the same way. I was I distracted don't... with Godfather by the, the makeup and the performance of um, Marlon Brando. <laughs> I think he's much better yeah. in other things. And I think just even um that character and that type of character if you watch the movie with matthew broderick that he did in the 90s called the freshman he takes another crack at that same character and he's so much better um and yeah. if he was that in the godfather i would feel the same way about godfather as most people um but i'm i'm with brando on it he needed another crack at it he needed yeah. uh to come at it in a different genre because the freshman's a bit funnier um yeah but he he gets that extra swing and man it's like he it it almost feels like revenge of the sith where like um i feel like it took until revenge of the sith for lucas to finally figure out exactly what a star wars movie actually is like everything yeah. else is just ideas and then that third film that final film of his he was like, it's almost like this aha moment before death. It's like you're glimpsing the afterlife and you're also glimpsing your past <laughs> life at the same time. It's like, he's like, ah, now I know what Star Wars is. And then he's gone, you know, and that I, I could cry just thinking about that. But that's what episode three is for me. It's just so he realizes what he's built and what it actually is. And he he makes the perfect version of it and yeah. then he's gone and it's just so beautiful. Um, I, I, I love that and I love moments like that and man, yeah. it's just cinema's heavy, dude. <laughs> yeah, it is. It, it truly is. And I, I feel like, like cinema I'm... is, is, is realizations. It's very personal realizations Oh yeah, made made concrete and made uh, livable well, and relivable for people that are completely different from you from all over the world. Like yeah, and it's it's it, allowing man. people to step into your shoes and embody something for a certain period of time without the danger of actually having to to go there emotionally or physically or you know anything like that. And it's yeah. it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Um. Do you have any uh, final thoughts? I feel like we're 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 uh, hitting that time. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Well, I just think, I think pure cinema as a term is so perfect and so beautiful. Um, and I don't know if it's necessarily something that can be used uh, in conjunction as like another word, like folk filmmaking or truly independent filmmaking or whatever. But it is something that I think is really important to us. And I think we'll, we'll carry it with us. Uh, and I, I would encourage you to make more pure cinema movies. Maybe there's one oh, where yeah. you're talking to Joel Haver, or maybe there's one where you're talking to somebody else or whatever, but just keep this going because I, I really think this could be an important series. Yeah. I, I do feel like, carrying through everything that I do I do carry that feeling of what a pure cinema I think tries to invoke which is is to make something with the with uh intense focus and creation that doesn't always have to be perfect it's not always exact but it but it, it it's a feeling it's like a it's like it's not just vapor it's like something you can actually touch it's like it's like fog or something like that and I, I think like with this series i do hope to make something that's tangible something that you know we can look back at at some point and see the, like there was something interesting there there was something and and we won't know until until it happens so um, i'm gonna probably yeah. get going C cody but uh this has been a it's been a great chat okay man Absolutely. And, uh, you know, it's, it's the old thing of like the purpose of art is to stand naked on stage. Like that old quote, I feel like the pure cinema has a certain nudity of like soul to it. And I think that's what pe keeps people coming back to our stuff for sure. They can feel it. Yeah. All right, man. You, Great talking you to you. Okay. Take bye -bye. care.